Hey folks, this is Riker with a preview of Darksiders 3, set to release November 27th on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. If you haven't, be sure to have checked out my other two videos in this series in which we explore the lore and the gameplay of the Darksiders series, which shares some thematic similarities with the Diablo series. Follow the link in the video description for more information on Darksiders 3, and thanks to THQ Nordic for sponsoring this video. So Darksiders 3 is an upcoming hack-and-slash action-adventure game set on a post-apocalyptic Earth. But this is a post-apocalyptic setting unlike any other, because it uses the term post-apocalyptic quite literally. The apocalypse has happened. Earth served as an epic battlefield for a war between angels and demons, and the only real loser was humanity. In Darksiders 3, you take on the role of one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Fury. In Darksiders 1, you played as another horseman, her brother, War. And in Darksiders 2, you played as Death. And presumably in a future game, we'll get to play as the fourth and final horseman, Strife. Now, while Darksiders 3 is a sequel, its story runs parallel to Darksiders 1 and 2. It follows Fury as she embarks on a mission for the Charred Council. We spoke about those guys in our lore video. And her mission is to destroy the seven deadly sins that have escaped to Earth during the apocalypse. And it seems like just as in Darksiders 1, you have a Watcher sent by the Charred Council following you around. But unlike Darksiders 1, this Watcher seems more supportive of you. Now, in my playthrough, I had access to two game demos in which I got to fight two of the seven deadly sins. Sloth, the Lord of the Flies, and Envy, Resentment Made Flesh. We'll get to them in the gameplay footage. So as we previously covered, Darksiders is a game series that revolves around three pillars of gameplay. Combat, puzzles, and platforming. From my play experience, it seems as though in Darksiders 3, the puzzles and platforming aspect is downplayed relative to Darksiders 2. But again, that just may be from my limited gameplay experience. What I did notice was that the platforming and puzzles in Darksiders 3 felt more organically part of the world than in Darksiders 2. In other words, they felt more like just regular obstacles in the world that I had to navigate rather than very clear, okay, this is where I have to jump. This is game elements plopped in by a designer. So it certainly helps with the immersion of the world. And man, is it a beautiful world. Typically when we think of a post-apocalyptic setting, I think the first thing that comes to mind is sort of a, a post-nuclear fallout, lots of monotone, gray, grungy, and while there are aspects of that, this is a much more vibrant and colorful post-apocalypse, at least in places. It seems as though, depending on where you go in the world, you're going to have different environments. And it seems as though the Seven Deadly Sins have left their mark on different parts of Earth. So, for instance, when you're off to fight Sloth, who's this giant, disgusting, insectoid creature, the closer you get to him, the more the world is warped to be this sort of insectoid hive. You're going through tunnels, subways. It's effectively, it's an abandoned, well, not abandoned, a former subway station and series of, of connected stations that you're going through, navigating, that have quite naturally been a haven for these insectoid creatures since it's, you know, ants travel through their labyrinthine tunnels, similarly with the subway station. So it's just a natural fit that this is where Sloth and his insectoid minions would go. Now, admittedly, spending a lot of time in these tunnels, there's a lot of tighter areas, a lot of uh, darker tones. And if that's the only glimpse you get of Darksiders, you could get maybe the wrong impression of the greater world. But there definitely are, even in those subway sections, areas that open up into beautiful views. There's this one particular scene where you see it looks like a part of the city has come crashing down. Uh, some form of, I guess, an earthquake has made a part of the city fall into a deep chasm that you can see. It's really beautiful and it seems like you can possibly travel there. In the future, when you have the right skills, that's something that the series has done as well, is that it shows you areas before you can get to them. And similarly with Sloth, from the very moment you enter the subway stations, you can see him. He's off in the distance. That's excellent foreshadowing. You know, 
we gotta beat that guy. That's the boss, and then you gotta spend a good hour or however long to get to him. Excellent use of foreshadowing. And in the other demo, I got to experience a much more vibrant and, and full of plant life setting. Gorgeous. This giant sort of world tree, this magic tree, these sort of trees are common in the universe of Darksiders. They have special magical significance. And just to see the overgrowth, again, it's it was impressive to me to see this world. And I look forward to seeing how much of the Earth is going to be transformed in what kind of different ways in the full game. As you're going around, you see the remnants of the war. You see dead angels, dead demons. And by their corpses, they frequently have a uh, collectible, not really a collectible, but an item that you can pick up. Uh, it tends to be crafting materials. I wasn't able to test out the crafting system, but it's clear that you're picking up a variety of crafting materials that can be used to augment your weaponry, which we'll get to in a little bit. Now, I gotta talk a little bit more about Sloth here, just because he <laughs> so perfectly embodied the sin. He's a little over the top, but, I mean, what else do you expect from a literal embodiment of one of the seven deadly sins? The voice acting was great. He's this gruesome-looking insectoid thing being carried on a throne, because he's so lazy, right? By other insectoid creatures, and in the fight... In the fight, it's a multi-stage fight, as you would expect uh, from a boss fight in Darksiders. You first have to kill the insects that are carrying him on his throne before you activate the next phase of the fight, where stuff gets real, because now he's gotten up off his fat butt, and now you got to fight him, and he flies a little bit, and it activates the much more difficult part of the fight. And I guess this seems like an appropriate time to start talking about the, the combat, which feels more difficult than in Darksiders 1 and Darksiders 2. It feels like enemies do more damage, uh, and if you're just mindless about the combat, you're gonna have a bad time. Darksiders 3 rewards you for being a little bit more methodical in your combat. Thoughtful, careful. You gotta time enemy attacks, learn their attack behaviors, animations, learn to dodge a lot, lock onto your target, and dodge. Because if you just charge in tanking everything, I don't know that that's a great strategy in this game. Now, if you perfectly time a dodge, time slows down, and you can execute a counter maneuver. And it seems that perfecting this technique is really critical to excelling in this game. Relative to the previous games, it seems you fight fewer enemies overall, but again, every individual enemy is a lot more difficult. Overall, I have to say, this is not an easy game. It's not a super difficult, super frustrating game, but it definitely provides a challenge. Once you figure out the certain trick on how to beat an enemy or how to progress. A subsequent playthrough of the area is definitely a lot easier, but I'm sure there'll be moments when you're gonna die and die until you figure out, oh, right, this is how I'm supposed to approach this. Like, there were some really difficult fights in my playthrough, and some of them I realized, oh, I don't actually have to fight this guy. There's this hidden exit that I could have just gone straight to rather than first die repeatedly against this brick wall of an enemy and finally manage to take him down and then be stumped and then realize, oh, there was this little exit all, all along. And that's sort of an example of how the difficulty doesn't just lie in the combat itself. This game does not hold your hand. You're presented with an open world, a non-linear experience. You have to figure out where to go and what to do. There's no map. You're encouraged to explore. You're going to go down paths down entirely optional segments, and you'll be rewarded for that with uh, items you'll find, with enemies to defeat, and thus more experience to get. We'll talk about that in a bit. You have no objective marker, and I believe that the order in which you kill the seven deadly sins is largely up to you. Everyone has to kill Envy first, but then after that, there's a lot of wiggle room in what order you kill the rest. So two different people playing this game will most likely have different experiences. And you might be wondering, well, how do you maintain any semblance of difficulty progression every time you kill one of the seven deadly sins, all other enemies get more difficult. So the game effectively progresses with you. That's my understanding, at least. Now let's talk a little bit about your toolkit. Fury's main weapon is a sort of whip. And it's not just used in combat, it's also an integral part of the platforming experience in Darksiders 3. You need to use it to swing like Tarzan from... Uh, not really branches, but different objects in the environment in order to access certain areas. It's definitely a cool and fun mechanic. 
And to talk about her other weapons, we need to discuss her hollow forms. This is really the big new mechanic to Darksiders 3. The new arsenal relative to the previous two games. Throughout the game, you're going to unlock different hollow forms. It appears that there's going to be four in total. Two have been revealed to us so far. The Flame Hollow and the Force Hollow. When you enter a hollow form, you have access to new abilities, new weapons, and new powers. So for instance, in the Flame Hollow, you take on a fiery appearance, your hair is on fire, and that's fine, you don't burn, and you unlock as a secondary weapon a pair of flails, which are very fast attacking and are kind of more like nunchucks in how they behave. And then some of your combo attacks will set enemies on fire. And then your sort of special ability in Flame Hollow is to wreathe yourself in flames for a period of time, setting any enemies near you on fire. Then in the Force Hollow, you take on a more purple appearance. And as your secondary weapon, you gain this giant warhammer. Complete opposite of the Fire Hollow weapon, this one is slow and hard-hitting. Some of the attacks will knock back enemies, and the special power here is one that sucks in enemies before doing a big burst of damage. And the Hollow forms don't just help you during combat. There are some areas of the world that you must use a Hollow form power to access. So for instance, there might be a bunch of cobwebs that you must burn through with your Fire form. Uh, there might be some rock obstacles that you must smash through with your force hollow. And then both of these forms have interesting interactions with water. When you're in the fire hollow, if you fall into water, the fire goes out, as expected. And in the force hollow, you actually sink straight to the bottom. You don't even swim in the force hollow, so you can use it to rapidly sink to the bottom of a, a body of water and walk along the bottom. This is sometimes helpful if you want to pick up an item at the bottom. I mean, you can also swim, but it's a little faster. Also, while in the fire hollow, you gain the ability to jump a lot higher. So there might be areas where you have to do a high jump and you can only get there using the fire hollow. I really look forward to seeing the other two hollows and what impact they'll have on gameplay. So outside of that, I think the rest of Darksiders 3 is sort of a combination of Darksiders 1 and Darksiders 2. So Darksiders 2, for instance, introduced a lot of RPG mechanics to the game. And it seems like in Darksiders 3, we've taken a step back from that. We still retained some degree of the RPG mechanics, but in a more simplified form, a little bit closer towards Darksiders 1. So for instance, you don't have items dropping like in Darksiders 2. Instead, you will augment items like in Darksiders 1, and to that effect, you have a lot of crafting materials that you find throughout the world, and you can use those to augment your weapons in a variety of ways. You also have a lot of different consumable items in Darksiders 3. Potions, if you want to call them, or shards, as they're more naturally called in the game. You have some potions that are mana potions that'll fuel your magic powers. You have a frenzy shard which temporarily increases your attack speed you have a fortification shard that will temporarily give you damage reduction you have your thorn shard which will attack any enemy that comes close to you and most of the consumables in darksiders 3 are on a global cooldown and have a casting animation so this just serves to increase the challenge a bit you can't just be popping your potions willy-nilly you have to make sure that you have a safe amount of time to consume the potion not get interrupted while you're doing so and then you want to make sure that you're timing these properly with the global cooldowns. So it did feel like healing was a little bit more difficult than in Darksiders 2, for instance. Now, Darksiders 3 does have a leveling system that it retains, and you gain attribute points. You have three attributes, health, which is self-explanatory, strength, which ups the damage of your basic attacks, and arcane, which ups the damage of your special attacks, let's say. Every time you level up, you gain an attribute point to spend in one of these three categories, and you can also get attribute points in other ways. Now, the currency system in Darksiders 3 is very similar to Darksiders 1. Anytime you kill an enemy, you gain souls, and souls act as a sort of XP and gold in one. So you can use souls at a vendor to buy potions or shards, but you can also use them at a vendor to effectively increase your XP and get closer to leveling up. And if you die, if you have souls on you that you have not deposited into XP, then you will drop your souls. But don't worry, they're not lost forever. If you go back to your corpse, you can recover your souls. So overall, Darksiders 3 looks like it has promise. What I'm most excited about is seeing all four hollow forms, fully seeing 
how they give you different abilities that will interact with the world in different ways, and really getting to see the world itself. The artistry of how they've decided to alter the environments based on the seven deadly sins. I'm looking forward to meeting all of the seven deadly sins and seeing how the story progresses because I've gotten really invested now in the story of the Darksiders series. And that is going to wrap up this video. As a reminder, if you haven't, check out our previous two videos on the Darksiders series. Thanks for watching. As a reminder, if you'd like more info on Darksiders 3, follow the link in the video description. If you enjoyed this video, please share it and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.